I'm not ashamed. In the fashion that we do, we believe by scripture, it's certainly according to what he has commanded and has required of us. One of the things about uh, the Lord's church is that it was designed in the mind of God long before we were ever here. And because of that, we have no say, we have no way of interjecting what we like, but rather we do it according to the will of God and his will only. When we begin to add to what God wants, it changes, it messes up, it makes it false as opposed to what's true. So we're here today to praise God and to celebrate him according to what his will has mandated for his people to worship. To all of our visitors, it's always a delight to have you on this Sunday morning. It's uh, wonderful to have you, and we want you to know that yes. truly you are our honored guest on this morning. We want you to continue to come and worship with us and ask questions of us, and prayerfully you'll sit down with us and we'll study and reason together uh, the word of God. And, uh, we would love to do that, and we just believe that if you have honest questions, I know there's an honest answer. If you have a Bible question, there's no doubt in my mind that there is a Bible answer. Amen. Be prayerful for those who stand in the need of prayer. We all need prayer at some point in our journey in life. Isn't that right, church? We all need for someone to talk to God on our behalf. And we believe that the prayers of the righteous changes things. They avail much in the mind and the heart of God. And so we ought to pray for one another. I, I did uh, get a message from Ben Down. He wanted you to comp continue to pray for him. Uh, he wants you to know that he does have some follow-up visits with uh, his doctors, but he believes that uh, everything will be uh, well with him, and it's po he's very positive uh, about his current state. So be praying for our brother Ben, and I know there are others that uh, uh, you will be praying for as the days and weeks that are ahead of us. Uh, never stop praying. Never stop talking to God, not only for yourselves, but for the church. I've been doing a series of lessons. I had to pause uh, last week because it was South Lake Family Sunday, and we had a guest uh, speaker. and. I wanted to uh, continue that, um, that uh, lesson series called Knowledge is Power. And I wanted us to really get a good understanding of how powerful the word of God is. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the text says, it is living, it's powerful. It cuts coming and going because it has a two-edged sword. Uh, it's likened to that. So uh, I want us to understand the more you understand the knowledge of God's word, it gives you power. And that power is designed to help you walk that walk daily, to help you to apply his word to your lives and to help you to be a teacher of his word. We've been talking about a text to uh, a young preacher by the name of Timothy. The letter is sent to him by his father in the faith, Paul. While Paul is pending and writing this letter, uh, he is suffering by way of being incarcerated. He's in jail. He's in chains. And even while he's in this kind of distress, God's work needs to what? Continue on. Paul's message uh, to Timothy is that even though suffering 
may occur, you must still be about the business of the Lord. Too often, 21st century saints sometimes would allow any and everything to stand in the way of their work for the kingdom. Paul is in jail. And I can imagine any of us being in jail. The last thing on our minds is to be writing somebody, trying to lift him up. Instead, we may feel we need what? Lifting up. So while you're in your distress mode, while you are in your challenging circumstances, uh, ain't no better time to keep on working for the Lord. At best, it'll keep your mind off of your stuff. Long enough to do what God wants you to do. So Paul is in jail and he's writing this letter uh, to Timothy. Timothy is the preacher of the church at Ephesus. And this congregation is going uh, through some things, um, particularly, Don, there are some members of the Lord's church that are beginning to teach some things that are contrary to the, the word of God. And so here you got this preacher uh, trying to do his best in teaching somehow because of the weight of what's going on in this church. He's feeling a little uh, distressed and uh, uh, maybe in his mind, Paul senses he's trying to give up or wants to probably relocate or uh, doesn't feel it anymore, but Paul tells him, I need you to stay there uh, and do the work that you have been called to do. No matter uh, where you are in the kingdom of God, you're going to go through some things, but that's the reason enough to keep on keeping on doing what God wants you to do. Here in our text, we have a teacher, that's Paul, trying to teach a preacher by the name of Timothy. But that's what we do. We are teachers. Teach teachers that who are, as members of the Lord's church, we teach people how to connect to Christ Jesus. That's the gospel of Christ. We should forever be vigilant in teaching our children, teaching our family, our friends, our neighbors, and even strangers. And when those students of ours begin to understand the gospel of Christ and obey the word of God by obedience to hearing and believing and confessing, uh, repenting and going down into the watery grave of baptism, they come up new creatures in Christ. Isn't that how it works? Uh, but the moment they come up as new creatures, the expectation is they start what? Teaching. So we all are teaching. We have a, I have the privilege of, of, of uh, teaching a new converts class and, uh, and we are trying our best to just start running uh, right away with their knowledge because we want our new converts to know the truth and to be grounded in the truth but I also want to teach them so they can go back and teach what? Somebody else. They ain't got to be a preacher to teach. They ain't got to be a member of the church for years on the end. They can start teaching right now, if nothing else, what they've done to become members of the body of Christ. Teachers, teaching, teachers. That's what we do. Uh, let me come down, because I want us to be patient uh, with a, a series of lessons like, like this. The reason I say that is because sometimes uh, members of the Lord's church, you get, you get a little weary when, when the preacher stays camped at a text too long. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, I hear you. And uh, uh, James, sometimes... James, one of my new students in my class. James, sometimes we get, we get kind of bored with it. We want to, we, we feel like we've learned all we can from a text. The interesting thing about Jesus in his teaching, uh, LaShawn, he would teach the same lesson 
over and over and over again because he knows the nature of I told y'all in the beginning of this series, wouldn't it be wonderful to have children? You could tell them just one time and they got it. Wouldn't it be wonderful to not have to repeat old lessons over and over again? And sometimes uh, we have to bring company to teaching uh, like a bell. Now, now, y'all don't whoop with, with bells. I, I forgot where I was. Uh, but, but sometimes you have to find ways to make sure they get the lesson. Hopefully, uh, that's the last time we have to discuss it. But not so, not so. The very nature of us is to uh, hear it one time and soon it's what? forgotten. And if some of us are sitting in a worship service, it goes in one ear. Yeah, I can finish right there. Can't I? Let's look at this. Let's look at this. This beautiful text. Now I'm down to uh, come on down to the last two verses of my series. And uh, I, I have to be honest, I, I really wanted to start right here, but so much good stuff ahead of this part of the text. I took you the long way. That's what Trey talked about. Sometimes you have to take the church the long route, and I took you the long route to these two verses. So stay with me as we sort of conclude this series uh, that knowledge is power. And I want the people of God, the body of Christ, to understand the more knowledge, the more power. Uh, in order to gain that knowledge, it's going to require you to do something. And we'll see it in this, in this text. Let's look at verse 14 of 2 Timothy, chapter 2. And we'll end in uh, verse 15. So I only have a couple of verses to read. Let's start at verse 14. The text says, I'm reading from King James. I know that's a bit unusual, but... King James will write it in such a way that uh, it makes the point more poignant and it makes it where it really, I grew up on King James. It's all I knew growing up. When I have Bible studies, I don't use NIV. Uh, I, I use King James or New King James. And so I want to encourage you as you're having Bible studies with all of the folks that are on your list. And I know you got a master list of a lot of folks that you have uh, already called and said, let's set up a time. We need to what? We need to study. By now, your list should have over 10 folk, maybe 20 folk, because we're going to baptize how many by the end of the year? 100. Let's look at the text. Of these things, put them in remembrance. Charging them before who? The Lord. That they strive not uh, about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now, now Paul, at this point of the text, he says, remember some things that I, I know I've, I've talked about a lot since the chapter opened. Uh, in chapter 2, uh, but I want you to remember these as we get to where I want you to be. Some of the things uh, uh, refers to what, what Paul had already said earlier in the chapter, uh, the responsibility we have as members of the Lord's church. One of the things he had already talked about uh, is to pass from God's truth to others. Who will then pass it on to others. So he says, don't forget that you as a child of God have the responsibility to give truth to those that come uh, across your path or those that you meet along life's path. He says, pass the truth on. Don't hold it to who? Yourself. Another thing he wants them to remember is to work diligently in the Lord's work like a soldier, like an athlete, even like a farmer. Then he wanted them to remember that Jesus is alive. Not only is he alive, he's sovereign. He wanted them to remember 
the power of God's word and how powerful it is. It's so powerful. It changed your life. He wanted them to remember the purpose of Jesus' work uh, and the work that he has called us to do. He wanted them, he wanted them to remember our calling to teach the truth and make sure when you teach that it's sound doctrine so that it cannot be forgotten. Every chance we get, teach somebody. That's 14. Let's look at 15. Then King James says, study. Other translation says, be diligent. If you combine both, be diligently studying. Uh, the text says, study. I know we get tired of uh, the passages that you think you know inside and out. Even study them more because there may be some nuggets of truth that have not been discovered by you. And somebody can come to a class and share principles and thought about a text you may not have considered. What Paul is telling Timothy, I don't care how difficult it gets at that church of Christ in Ephesus. I want you to study because somebody in that church. It's going to come up with something that did not come from God that you're going to have to deal with. And if you don't know how to deal with it, it's going to sweep you away. And if it sweeps the preacher away, guess what happens to the members? Paul's encouragement was not that of pity because he was going through some things, uh, not because he was suffering because members of the Lord's church and the church of Ephesus were covered up with falsehood. Uh, but he sent this letter. He says, study because of the full admonition that embraces, that come along with being a diligent, persistent, committed, and zealous teacher. If you're going to teach folk about the gospel of, of Christ, you need to be in a Bible study learning something. I talked to a, a, a mentor of mine, and uh, he has been preaching much longer than I have. And he says, Vernon, I'm telling you, in the Lord's church, one of our biggest struggles is to get folk to come to Bible class. I, I don't even mind telling you who he is. Uh, Harold Red, he's been here before. Uh, uh, Scholarly he is, a uh, great man of God, knows a lot, he teaches well. Uh, he tells me that, and it was this week, and he said, folk in the Lord's church don't, they, they develop a pattern of behavior where they don't like to come to Bible class. Then he says, what happens is when you baptize new folk into Christ, their eyes are wide open. What they notice quickly is they see you for worship. And then when Bible class comes and it's empty or near empty, the thought process in their mind is, where is everybody else? What's happened to their persistence, their diligence, their commitment to what? To study. And then guess what they do? At first, they're on fire because they found the truth. They want it, they want it. They can't get enough of it, but eventually the Fire gets a little doused because they deformed relationship with members of the Lord's church that don't come. And show the same what? Fire for study. And then they start to wean off. Eventually, they stop what? Come together. And so now the church is in this rut. 
as sweet, as good, as great as the gospel is. It ought to be that you can't get what? Enough. It's like, it's like me with dessert. I can't get a... Tim, I can eat cake before my palate and be just as... Just as happy as I want to be. Uh, uh, I give you some, a bag of cookies or pie or cake and I'm, I'm right where I want to be. Uh, uh, I, 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 sometimes it's, we just get tired. People just don't want it anymore. Paul writes about being diligent. He says a diligent teacher gives all they have maximum effort. Uh, not only maximum effort, he, they, 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 uh, diligent teachers, uh, they do all of that to impart God's truth as completely and clearly as one interpretation as possible. That's a diligent teacher. That's somebody who studies. A diligent teacher spends time Studying in order to commit to excellence in examining and not only examining but understanding and not only understanding but also explaining. Not only explaining but applying God's word. I give that to you again. A diligent teacher that studies spends time studying in order to commit to excellence in the house of God. That should always be running in it. A spirit of what? Excellence. Excellence in what? Examining and understanding and explaining and applying the word of God. Some folk that are in denominational settings can run circles around us with falsehood. We ought to be ashamed. They have their own doctrine. They study it. They live with it. They breathe it. They eat it. They sleep with it. And they'll come sharing with you. They want circles around you. And they want circles around the people of God. And they got false doctrine doing so. Paul says, study. A diligent teacher isn't concerned about pleasing people. And certainly not to please oneself. But what a diligent teacher wants to do, they want to get approval of the one who has called him, enlisted him, chose him. And that's the Lord. He's more, he spends more time concerned about what the Lord thinks as opposed to what some family member thinks, some friend thinks, some co-worker thinks. Sometimes we get bogged down in our teaching. We're more concerned about folk than God. It's all about pleasing God. That's why we study the way we study. That's why every child of God ought to make it their business. I'm coming to Bible class. If nobody in my family comes, I'm driving right up there. I want to know as much as I can know because knowledge is power. The power of God is going to help me through my personal life. It'll help me with my relationship life. It'll help me on my job life. It'll help me in my church life. I need that kind of power because the world has beat me up long enough. I need something to help lift my spirit. That's the word of God. But the only way you're going to know it is you got to what? Study. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Let me show you something real quickly. I, I didn't give it to them to put on the board, just one verse. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from the New King James, the verse is 4. Watch what it says. It says, but as we have been approved by God. Told it to the church. We have been approved by God to be entrusted. With what? With the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing to men, but God. 
who tests what? Our hearts. When you teach sound doctrine, you have nothing to be ashamed of. As if you have done something dishonorable. If anybody ought to be ashamed, guess who it ought to be? If anybody needs to be ashamed, it ought to be those who are teaching false doctrine. I was telling my class, my new converse class this morning, we, we were reading uh, Matthew chapter 16, particularly uh, verse 18. We were talking about how Jesus is the builder. He's built. Uh, he says, I, I will build my church in that verse. I asked my class, is church singular or is it common poor? They say in, in this text, it's singular. He's talking about one. He's the architect. He's the Lord of the church. Uh, it's his church. However he designs the church, not this brick and mortar where you are. The practices, the teachings are from Christ, not some man who thinks he's smart as Christ, if not smart. So if anybody ought to be ashamed, it ought to be those teaching false doctrine. The word of God can stand on its own. You don't need to dress it up. Truth doesn't need to be propped up. You don't need to add to it. You don't need to take away anything from it. God's truth can sustain itself. It needs members of the church, what? To share it. God's truth freely stands forever. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, the verse is 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. For what? For doctrine. So when you, I told my class this morning, I said, you've heard and you've seen and you've been exposed to a lot of churches' doctrine. And uh, I said, this is a good test for stuff that you hear. If it matches the pattern of doctrine and text, you are right. It should fit like a glove. If you're teaching practices and, 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 and doctrine positions and it bumps heads with God's word, you got a problem. Because God's word is all true. So what suggests is somebody has exposed you to a lie. All scripture. Now, the only way to know that is you got to what? Ah, you're with me. You're with me. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all what? Good works. So what is it that we have to be ashamed of? The mark of a faithful teacher is how you handle, not just handle, but you need to handle accurately. The word of truth, which means you need to, the word of God, it cuts like a straight line. A craftsman's cutting a straight line. A farmer plowing a row, a straight row, a mason setting, a, 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 a straight line of bricks. Uh, the first and the most important principle is that uh, it's based doctrine and standards of living on Scripture and based it on Scripture alone. Let me give you a life application. I'll have my seat. Listen to me carefully, or we'll hear this again. As Christians become less and less familiar with Scripture and sound doctrine, on the first hand, regular basis, we become easy prey for teaching that sound preaching, but not. 
so less and less demons would are uh, enabled to distinguish falsehood from truth. First Timothy four says, verse one says, now the Spirit expressly says. I know I've been on this for a while. I, I know I've been harping on us coming to Bible class. I know I've been on us about studying. Uh, I think that we treated those lessons like we always treat those lessons, in one ear and out the other, because uh, our attendance on Wednesday night and Sunday morning has not really increased at all. Now, the Spirit actually says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. In other words, there's going to be a time in history of the church of Christ. Folk would leave the church of Christ. Why, did, why would you want to leave the church? Why would you want to leave the one? Why would you want to leave truth? Why would you trade uh, truth for a lie? And sometimes we do. Sometimes we got to have something so bad, we, and, and the truth is staring us right in the face. But we believe the lie that's being told us, and we get swept away in relationships. We ain't got no business being in because we just want so bad. Some will. The faith. Giving heed or accepting or allowing to deceiving spirits. Y'all see that? Why would you leave the church and embrace a deceiving spirit? Not only are they embracing deceiving spirits and what? Doctrine. Denominationalism is built on doctrinal positions that are away from the New Testament church. Somebody said, how do you know? Because all you have to do is watch what they teach and watch what they practice. You'll see a stark difference in what the Lord said and what some man or some woman has said, and they get away with it because ain't nobody what? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of what? Demons. More dangerous. This is something even more dangerous where false, uh, false teachers in the church. Watch what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. Look, I like this. Watch this church. But there were also false what? Prophets. Among who? The people in text uh, represent the church. And there were false prophets that roamed and lived among the church. Even as there false among who? This is the part that's more horrible. That they don't, they don't do it openly. They wait till you come to the house for dinner. And while you're sitting around the dinner table, they start sharing stuff. They ain't got no business talking about as it relates to the doctrine of Christ. They do it secretly. They did it family, one family at a time. They were cowards because if they come with it in a Bible class at church, somebody ought to strike it down. But see, they don't come to a Bible class with that nonsense. They, call, they wait till y'all driving around. Can you give me a ride to work? My car? Well, by the way, uh, I, I heard that it's all right to do this. Oh, uh, why don't we do this? And we need to do more of this at church. And I don't understand why they keep blocking us from doing stuff like this. What do you think? And you start, that sounds kind of good. And sometimes it's just a matter of us adding a verse to something. And it's God sent now. All out of context. 
but there were also false prophets among the people. Even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly, that's key to the text, bring in destructive heresy, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. All because we have a hard time with Matthew 28. It's not on the board. I'll read it to you. We have a difficult time with this text. Find it in your Bible. Write it up. We have a hard time with Matthew chapter 28. And the verse is 18. The text says in verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me. Where? In heaven and on earth. This is where trouble comes in for us as members of the Lord's church. Verse 19 says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We have such a difficult time with this. Maybe because it has something to do with the next verse, teaching. Teaching. That's probably why we have a hard time with this command. This is a direct command. This is not optional, and I think we have a problem with it because of teaching. Teaching them to observe what? All things that I have commanded you. And then guess what he says? He's always with you no matter who you talk to. He says, and lo, I am with you. How? Always. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to be ashamed of because I'm with you even to the end of the age. Everybody in South Lake ought to say, amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much for the truth. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the opportunity to learn and to teach and become teachers. Help us to see this truth in light of our own personal lives and how we need to do so much better when it comes to sharing your word. Even if it causes us to suffer agony and pain and hurt by words people will say, things they'll do to us, uh, how they will ostracize us in some cases. Let us still work as if uh, our lives depended on it by teaching and teaching and teaching until you come together. Pray that that diligence, that persistence, that commitment can be felt through our entire church and that we don't play games with you. Lord, we ask this in the one who paid a price that no one else could pay, that all of God's people say, amen. If you want to come to Christ, you must do it how they did it in New Testament. You can't do